And today we begin in the book of Titus, August 23rd, and I'm beginning in Titus chapter 1. Some interesting things about uh, the book of Titus. It's one of Paul's final letters, and it emphasizes the church and its structure and its ordinance. In fact, if you look at this, you'll find in chapter 1, it deals with the church as an organization. Secondly, it uh, deals in chapter 2, it deals with the church uh what the church is to preach and to teach, and that is the Word of God. And chapter 3, it deals with the church uh, as to perform good works. Now, as we look in this passage, you'll see, especially in this one, chapter 1, dealing with elders as spiritual leaders and overseers given responsibility for the spiritual oversight of the church. They represent the local church. They, are, they have spiritual oversight in that local assembly, and they are teachers of the Word of God. These are the things that Paul, that the, Paul is addressing in this passage of Scripture. Now, his opening indi indicates his calling and his hope, which was customary to him. You see this in verse 1. He identifies himself as a bondservant of God, that he's an apostle of Jesus. And then uh, he uh, transitions in verse 2 and says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. You know, it's it, it, Paul's clean to this because he, remember in the pa previous chapter, he talked about sensing that his time had, is arriving, his departure is at hand. And so he's, you and I cling to the promises because listen, if we live in this world, and, and I don't care if you live to be 80, 90 years of age, if indeed that's all there is to life, it, it really is a very meaningless, vain proposition because we're here like a vapor we appear for a while and then we vanish away but Paul is hanging on to the promise and and that being of eternal life and he gives it something not only that it's from God and he says he cannot lie which which he's affirming this is guaranteed this is an unconditional guarantee as you put your faith in Jesus Christ eternal life you're going to live forever and ever and ever forever and uh and, and it says promised before time began. Do you realize that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them as eternal beings. They were never to have gotten sick and they would never have died a physical death. And, uh, and yet when sin entered, he said, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. He was speaking about the physical death and curse that would come upon them with sickness. But the uh, marking inside of Adam and Eve was eternal. And so you've got uh, the eternal element of God. Created in the image of God, they would live forever. And so when we look at this and uh, uh, while they died physically, then it comes down to eternal life. And eternal life will be either in heaven or it will be in hell. But you'll live forever. There's no such thing as annihilation. Some people like that. They think that if they commit suicide and get out of this hell, but only to find they're planted in another hell if you know, they're not ready to meet Jesus. And so the whole promise here is of eternal life is that we know we're gonna live forever and in a world that we cannot imagine. And if that causes you to be overwhelmed because you're thinking, what am I gonna do you know, if I'm gonna live forever? Well, cheer up because it's the world that God always intended for you and I to be a part of. We're gonna be a part of the world a paradise of God without the curse, without, and they're going to have uh, responsibilities and it's going to be a joy and we're going to be joining together and participating in no more sickness and all of that's going to be beautiful. Paul's looking forward to that and, and, and identifies that, it, that this was promised before time began. This was the plan of God. Now look what he says in verse three, verse three, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching. And preaching is the channel by which Men and women are introduced to the realities of Jesus Christ who came to give life. Uh, and Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and live it more abundantly. That Jesus came that men could, could live, that, uh, uh, that dead men could to experience resurrection power inside of them, both here and in the place that Jesus said is being prepared for them. Now look down in uh, uh, the verse 5 as he begins to talk about an orderly church that must have ordained elders who meet prescribed requirements. And we don't just put people in positions because, hey, they hold prestige or, uh, you know, they, they're, they're businessmen that from the community that, you know, will be able to help the church. That's a wrong position. We, there are expectations because everything rises and falls on leadership. And so no wonder the enemy is so 
um, intentional about bringing down pastors and evangelists and elders because it's the domino effect. If he can get the, the general, if he can get the top guy knocked off, then uh, those under them are, are all set off, you know, off balance because it, it becomes a surprise. And, uh, and, and people think, well, you know, maybe there's nothing to this. And if he turns away, who am I? So anyways, but he, he says, uh, verse uh, one, set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city. This is the line of authority that God has established within the local church. He's, and, and he gives a lot of the same criteria that we read about in, uh, first, uh, in, in Timothy, in which he says, that, you know, blameless, uh, the steward of God, not self-willed, not given uh, to wine, not quick-tempered, uh, not greedy for money, uh, hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word. And uh, uh, as he has been taught, that he may be able, uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort, convict those who are contradict. So you see the criteria and the qualifications of elders very steep. And we uh, do an injustice when we just place people carelessly in positions. It ought to be prayerfully, carefully evaluated, and each individual examined to determine that if they temperament and their spiritual qualifications meet that, because indeed it is pivotal in the life of the church because the end, there's going to be issues in the church. The enemy is going to be attacking. Things are going to be happening. And we've got to have men and women who know the heart of God. Now look down in verse 10. For there, he talks about bad reputations of the Cretans. Now look, he says there are many insubordinate. They're idle talkers. There are uh, deceivers. Uh, and then he said, whose mouths must be stopped. Uh, who subvert whole uh, households. That there, there's troublemakers. There, there are people here that are causing chaos and, and no doubt in the lives of maybe younger Christians or, 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 or infant believers. And he says, teaching things, what does it says? Teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So the motivation for some who are preachers or teachers is they're doing it for what's in it for them. And that may be financial, uh, but it could also be just position. And, and just like the religious leaders wanted attention, and they were wanted to be seen praying on the street corners, and they wanted the best places to be seated. And there are some people that are in ministry or doing it who are in an elder who do it for the position, for the wrong motive, for the wrong purpose. And and he's uncovering this. And then he says uh, they've got to have they got to be sound in faith. But he says this in verse uh, fourteen, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. They know we can't be swayed by every stupid thing that comes along and now with the internet and you know with google and and youtube we we, we have the availability of all kinds of crazy teachings things that just simply are, are are not sound doctrine and and so people turn it on and they listen to it and they're and and and, and is leading people down uh, you know <clears throat> in, in apostasy really and so and he's talking about that, and, and look what he says, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And this is the danger. Um, you know, you, if you begin to take that path of listening to uh, false teachings or listening to teachers that are, are, you know, that are not good, solid men of the word, it's dangerous. And it says this, they profess to know God, but their works they didn't, with their words, they denied him. In other words, faith without works is dead. And, and we've got to become very discerning in this hour and be able to determine where people are at. I think that there's the testing and for the pastors, of elders, of evangelists. We've got to see their heart. We've got to know what's there. And we've been called. And the fact is there's this emphasis upon church discipline that we do indeed need to rebuke sharply, as the Bible tells us there in verse 19. Uh, verse 13 rather, and that, that we may have sound truth uh, amongst our ranks. And so, but the emphasis is faith without works is dead. You can't speak it, have a form of godliness, but denying the power. We've got to walk in the power and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. My challenge to you is we look at this passage right here, uh, your uh, calling and your hope is sure. It, it, there's, there's the promise of eternal life. Don't get discouraged by a few inconveniences and troubles in this life. Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in the world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. 
I pray you be blessed. Walk in the promise of God today.